Okay, that was easy. Um, all right, I'd like to call the meeting to order. It's uh, six oh five. Um, the first thing we're going to do is take a roll call. So um, I, I'm going to just read down the, our roster, and everyone can say here. So um, if they're here, uh, please. Uh, Dave Hammond, I'm here. I'm uh, Kevin Bowdler. Yeah. Jim Lathrop. Say, Jim, just please speak. You're on mute. So just so. I'm, I'm here. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Just so it's on the record. Su Suzanne Lane. Here. Rich Bellastrocki, not here. Tim McFadden, here. Bill Hobbs, not here. Virginia Abernathy, not here. Pete Robinson, here. Uh, Chris Donahue, not here. And Colin Hagan, here. Colin, did you say here? Here, yep. Yep, thank you. Uh, and our newest member, John Godin. I am here. So um, we're going to approve the minutes and get um, Don Poland on as close to 6.15 as possible. But uh, So let's approve the minutes first. And then I want to introduce John Godin, because he has to actually go uh, to another meeting at 7. So. Um, I'm going to move that up from the bottom of the agenda so he can be here. He was just um, made a member and appointed last night at the board select meeting. So, first of all, is uh, approve the the minutes. Uh, we entertain the um, the development team that uh, at that meeting we entertain the development team for the uh, 32 Broadway Mystic Hotel project, and we uh, made a decision to write a letter. Uh, of support for that, which was submitted to um, thanks to Pete Robinson for drafting that that was submitted to the uh, planning and zoning commission. Um, they actually continued it from the first hearing um, to a second one this week. Uh, but the good news is, is that the project was approved. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see um, what comes about. There was uh, there was definitely uh, it's very from uh, in the readers' comments today from uh, many comments about the the design. So we'll see how that goes. We also had Don Poland for the first, uh, um, I guess, um, briefing of the EDC for progress on developing our uh, uh, affordable housing plan and. Uh, what Don has mainly done up to that point was uh, was research and um, demographics and and uh, you know kind of foundational information like that, which he shared with us. Um, we uh, Jim gave us a briefing on the uh, on the phase one follow up study for the acquiring the circus lot effort, and we voted on our meetings, which are. Uh, for, to the calendar 2021, which are going to be the second Tuesday of every month. So, um, can I uh, entertain a motion to have those minutes approved? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting of October 27th. And is there a second? Second. That was Pete, right? Yep. Are there any comments, corrections, edits, mistakes, misspellings? All right, so um, the minutes will uh, be filed at Town Hall, and uh, all in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 And any opposed? Abstain, not in attendance. <clears throat> and that was Dan? John. That was John. John, John Gordon. Gordon. Yeah. Yep. All right. Abstain, not in attendance. Yep. Uh, okay, very good. So, um, for the record, all were in favor. John Gordon abstained. 
he wasn't yet a member of the EDC. All right, so I want to introduce John Godin now. Um, Carol put in an application for ADC membership at, um, at Town Hall, and we had a great conversation a couple of weeks ago. And so what I want to do is um, um, I won't introduce the whole, the whole group to you, John. I think maybe pick up as you go and uh, rather than, than spend the time doing that. But if you could say a little bit about your background and, and sort of your interest in the EDC and maybe in yeah, you know, it doesn't have to be 20 words or less, but just a, a brief summary. Oh, no problem. Uh, so name is John Godin. I have lived full time in Stonington for about a little over a year, but I was a part time resident on the weekends from early 16. What turned into buying a small ranch and adding a kitchen and a few renovations turned into a gut rehab for three years. So uh, but I am a full time uh, resident now. And I just retired from GE Capital about 17 months ago. I was in uh, financial service for them for 25 years, actually worked on the sale of GE Capital for the last four and a half years. Um, my interest in EDC, when I lived, I lived up in uh, Sandy Hook, Connecticut, so part of Newtown for 13 years. And I was involved actively in the town on the Board of Assessment Appeals, Chair of the Board of Finance, Charter Revision Commission. I work with EDC a lot on the Board of Finance going through you know, tax abatement proposals. It was a way, EDC was a way for me to get involved. Um, first being in town, business growth is important to me. It's something I've been passionate about. And like everything in every town, people do not want to pay a lot of taxes. Um, and typically are frugal. And the best way to do that is growing the grand list, which is what you guys and gals really want to help out with uh, relative to the town. A little bit of personal background. You heard Dave and I speaking earlier. I'm an avid runner. I ran high school and college track. Undergrad, I went to Bentley College, now Bentley University, and I went to grad school at UConn. My wife and I have been married 32 years, and I have two sons in uh, grad school right now, one at Penn State and one at UMass Lowell. So that's me in a nutshell. I am from Northern Rhode Island. Uh, if you notice, I'm trying to get rid of most of the accent. Took 10 years of living in suburban Illinois, uh, Chicago to do that. It comes out when I talk to my dad. So <laughs> I, I can't get rid of the Woonsocket. <laughs> so, and notice I am retired in the state of Connecticut. So that's not normal for many people. <laughs> so, but it, it, you know what? I grew up coming to Mystic, the seaport and the aquarium as a kid on school visits. And I tell the story that if you've lived in Stonington long enough, I actually used to work at the old IGA in Pawkatuck when I was in college. So it's not like I haven't been here before. And I love the town. And I live in the Stonington section of Stonington, right on Lambert's Cove. So, which cracks me up because this is the town of Stonington. It's not Pawkatuck. It's not Mystic. It's the town of Stonington. But that's where I live. So I look forward to working with all of you and getting to know everyone. Uh, this, is, this is Kevin, and we're so pleased to have you join us. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. I get a little excited about stuff like this. So if I talk fast and I'm very passionate, just be patient with me. <laughs> so, so, John, was that first national that you worked at? I worked... Uh, yeah, I think that's what it was called. It, it, yeah. it, it was known as the... Yeah, the IG gym is now. Yeah, where Renegade is. Now, this is a funny story. They used to tell me, you need to go to the IGA in Pawkatuck. And I used to ask, where in Pawtucket is it? <laughs> I said, no, it's Pawkatuck. I said, no, it's Pawtucket. No, literally, we'd have this conversation, and then you cross the river, and there it is. So I vividly remember that probably rotating 1980, this is embarrassing, 1984, 85. Worked there many times. That was a uh, sales rep for RJR and Nabisco. Very good. Um, thank you again, John, and welcome. Um, I'll extend welcome from everybody. Uh, I'm, and uh, uh, just let the record show that Virginia Abernathy has joined. So uh, welcome, Virginia. To the meeting, uh, Virginia, we already approved the minutes without you from last uh, meeting, and then uh, we just introduced our new member, John Bowden. Uh, 
And now what we're, we're going to do is turn to our feature presentation and Don Poland. So, Don, I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, I, if you're going to share your screen, you can go ahead and grab the control and uh, and take it away. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Uh, give me a moment here to share my screen. And in addition to sharing my screen, just let me get both my screens set up so I can see you guys. And tonight my intent is to uh, give you guys an update. So as part of the scope of work, uh, I presented last week kind of this overview on affordable housing. And then I presented you with kind of the raw data on some of the demographic and housing analysis and also the housing needs assessment data. Uh, the second report being presented as part of this, uh, as part of the scope of work was to uh, do a review of the land use regulations, specifically the zoning regulations uh, to identify kind of barriers or impediments to housing and affordable housing. So, I'm going to give you a brief overview of that tonight. Uh, the report's actually been filed with staff. I'm just waiting for kind of go ahead and think to take draft off of it. Uh, but I'll give you guys a general overview of that tonight. So basically, quick introduction, you know, look at the dynamics of zoning and housing investment, and then the zoning reg review, and then wrap up with two quick sections on permitting and uh, on permitting processes. So, introduction, we did a comprehensive view to identify impediments. Uh, just some basic things here, kind of housing, housing investment flows to the location of demand. So demand's always important and we really can't control from there from a regulatory sense. Uh, also reasonable returns on the investor side and then ultimately least resistance and actually in the go york office are brokers and persons that don't do the consulting advising stuff that i do that deal more with the real estate development itself they have this nice big sign on the wall that says time kills deals and uh, that's kind of the idea of this flows to least resistance uh, you know, the more impediments, time being one of them, uh, that get in the way of development ultimately can send uh, investment to other locations. So regulatory uh, impediments obstruct flow, and then regulatory impediments uh, that result in excessive costs or high risk also obstruct flow. So I was looking for things, uh, in the regulations that may create, you know, this higher, uh, this higher risk or uh, higher cost to development. I'm not going to go through every single line, but ultimately getting to this place of kind of government's role is uh, is has to take into consideration and kind of understand the dynamics of financial feasibility, predictability, and confidence for a development to go forward. It's not our role to judge whether or not, you know, cost or risk or returns are right or proper or whatever, but to really understand that dynamic. Ultimately, the regulatory role is protect public health, safety, welfare, conserve value of properties, and then things like foster environmental, uh, foster an environment of equity environment of equitable access and regard uh, and also providing kind of that social safety net. Forgive me if I'm kind of stuttering <laughs> or messing up my words a bit. I'm on like hour 58 of the week already and I've just hit a wall somewhere around three o'clock this afternoon. So I apologize and bear with me. Uh, so from a regulatory perspective, government should remove impediments uh, that obstruct the market from fulfilling the need for housing. That's essentially what we're trying to get at here. And I just want to make clear, never are my recommendations intended to undermine that role of protecting public health, safety or welfare, or conserving property values and so forth. Uh, I recognize that there needs to be this balance between kind of the role of government 
and ultimately kind of the role of markets or, you know, removing those impediments from the market. So that's what this really kind of gets at, this idea that a community must understand the role of zoning and how it plays. Uh, all codes and regulations impact markets. You know, we, we have this kind of fallacy of, you know, we live in a market society. No, we really don't. Uh, we do have a free market, but it's highly regulated. And especially when we're talking about real estate development and land use and zoning, we're talking about a highly regulated market. So there's naturally occurring impediments within that. What we don't want is for it to be excessive to a point that we start steering people off in other directions. Uh, so zoning is not only a tool for protecting public health, safety, and welfare, uh, it's also a tool for implementing the comprehensive plan, the plan of conservation and development, and therefore the plan for the vision for housing in the community and taking on issues, specifically things like affordable housing. So ultimately we need to strike a balance and we walk a fine line uh, between kind of firmly protecting and asserting the community values and characters and allowing for, you know, investment to occur. Uh, there's a more broader narrative in the actual report about, you know, you guys have an amazing community. Uh, you have this amazing kind of dual, I actually, I'd say this, uh, triple identity of kind of rural, uh, New England and seaport aesthetic. And your regulations do an incredible job of kind of asserting that character and protecting that character. And that's extremely important. And as a more wealthy community, you kind of, you can do that and you should do that. So my reviewing your regs, I really kind of strike this balance. There, there are places that I would criticize other communities in the sense of saying, ah, your landscape requirements are a bit over the top and so forth. But you guys, as, as the community that you are, you can demand a higher level or even a higher cost of site design. And I don't give you guys a hard time on that. I want you to promote your community as it is and kind of protect that character of it. Uh, but at the same time, there are other things that you can do within the regulations uh, that I think would benefit housing and ultimately the investment in housing. So there's nine uh, kind of primary things that I identified. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. I will, as soon as I end, I will email these slides off to you guys. Uh, I just kind of ran out of time to get them to you in advance to that. So accessory apartments, the Zoning Commission recently amended the zoning regulations to include accessory apartments. Uh, and to be honest with you, it's a good regulation and I'm very positive about it. But my role is to kind of push you guys and challenge you guys. So, uh, you know, I, for, so for my recommendation, you know, I recognize that it's a great improve, uh, it's improved greatly. Therefore, I have no specific recommendation. However, I think there are some things that could be considered. Uh, there is a large minimum, the, remove or reduce the minimum square footage sign size uh, provision for the primary house. It's just kind of one of these things. So, you know, from my perspective, what you can have an accessory apartment if you have a 2100 square foot house, but you can't if you have a 1900 square foot house. And also kind of like, you know, why can't you have an accessory apartment in a 1500 square foot house? So I, I, I think that's something that could be considered. And also some other communities, and I believe North Stonington to your north, they have a dual provision in their uh, accessory apartments. And that one is you can do an accessory apartment kind of as you guys have laid it out. But they do have a second track where you can actually have that accessory apartment deed restricted as a qualified affordable unit. Uh, you're not forcing anyone to do that. You're not telling them it has to be deed restricted, but you're giving them the option to do it if they so choose. And if they do, then ultimately that unit will count towards your qualifying units with 8-30G. Uh, your duplex provisions. One is, you know, you, you're an, you're an older community, you have these older villages, and I applaud you because you have regulations that allow duplexes. Uh, and that's something, and the, the triplexes, the three families. 
that's something that in many communities you don't see anymore. Uh, and, you know, it's great that you have them. That being said, there are some kind of restrictive provisions on there. Once again, so I say consider uh, amending design regs to remove the provisions to specific duplex units. So it's in this paragraph here uh, where, you know, I talk about there's provisions of increased requirements on duplex units simply function as and create impediments. So, uh, the, 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 the. so there's things like you guys require double the minimum lot size. So if it's a 10,000 square foot lot for a single family house, you guys regulations require a 20,000 square foot lot for a two for a duplex house. I find that as kind of self defeating. <laughs> you know, the idea of allowing duplexes is to allow some additional density. So why wouldn't you, you know, allow that duplex on the 10,000 square foot lot? And knowing that land costs are high in Stonington, I recognize that by doing that double lot size, you're probably not creating any type of incentive for that. Uh, I then put in some other considerations. Uh, there is an approach to zoning that's called zero lot provisions or zero lot line provisions. Uh, and I provide two examples of this down here. And it could be used for duplexes, it could be used for single family units. And it can even be used for townhouses. Oddly enough, it's not a very common provision, or at least around here, but I've actually owned two properties now that fit both of these examples. Uh, never by choice on my part, and I'm not trying to promote it because of that. I just, when I was writing this the other day, I realized like, hey, I've actually had two zero lot line properties. So the diagram down here on the left hand side. Uh, shows zero lot line functioning on smaller lots, allowing the house to actually one side of it be basically built to the property line, uh, freeing up, providing more yard space to the other side. Uh, and this is what I have, a second home that I have in Maine. My house is designed exactly like that. Uh, this example over here is kind of for the townhouse, and I used to own a townhouse in Hartford that was a zero lot line. And that is you can have attached housing units and the property line splits the wall between the two units. And usually fire code requires that that be a, you know, a higher rated firewall. But essentially, therefore, you could have, you know, townhouse units that don't necessarily have to be a condo association. So I have a 3,000 square foot townhouse on a 2,500 square foot lot. Uh, more space within the house than on the lot itself, but just enough lot to have a little yard. It's just once again with your village character and so forth and with infill development on maybe some vacant lots and places like Pocketuck or so forth, uh, a provision like this might provide some fl uh, flexibility and possibly even some incentive. The multifamily residential zoning is kind of odd in your regs, uh, and it's probably just more due to a history uh, than anything specific, but there's no, you actually never use the phrase multifamily in the regs. The regs have adopted this phrase of attached housing in place of multifamily, and then the density restrictions on that attached housing are very low. You don't really allow, allow much density in that sense. Uh, and it's only allowed in three traditional zones. You then do allow some more conventional multifamily development in your gateway district and in your neighborhood development districts as special regulations. Uh, so my basic recommendation is consider amendments to the zoning regs to allow multifamily uses in residential districts served by public water and public sewer. Uh, I then go on to say there's some other considerations like mixed use uh, commercial and residential development in commercial zones. I'll get to your mixed use provision a bit later, uh, but at the end of the day, if you look at kind of exit, hopefully I get these right, uh, is it exit 91 where the seaport and the village are, I believe, and then exit 92 is the next one up the road uh, south near the North Stonington border there. Uh, 
I think both of those areas could benefit greatly from allowing uh, mixed use development in those commercial zones. And I know there is a way to kind of do it with the neighborhood development district today, but I think you, if you were more direct in doing it, you might attract more investment. And especially up around the 91 exit, exit 91, uh, there's some marginal older properties up there that have just kind of passed their time. Uh, and I think allowing for mixed use could be a vehicle to getting those properties, you know, redeveloped and more modernized. So I think there's a good kind of economic development uh, bent on that. Uh, so your attached housing provision, uh, I talk about further here. Uh, and just, you know, my recommendation is right now it has a really large minimum lot size. I think if you ratchet that down, you could get some smaller multifamily development once again as infill, uh, maybe in some locations. An increase in the units per acre would definitely be, be beneficial. I think the low density that's allowed right now is probably prohibitive. And increasing where appropriate, some, you know, allowing a little more in height. I think right now it's restricted to kind of like two stories. If you allowed three or four stories, you could maybe uh, come up with, uh, once again, allow that density without a drastic change in the bulk area and massing. I mentioned down here, you know, a three story townhouse design can include two units on three floors that you can do a townhouse two unit and then do a third floor loft. So that, that's a simple way of getting a bit more density. And I'll show you that on this slide. This is a project I've been working on out in Colorado. And it's kind of dual point here on my part is just, uh, this is a retail center uh, that they're looking to breathe some new life in. There is a parking lot associated with it that's never utilized. 3.5 acre site and we're doing some market research and some schematics to develop some housing on that lot. So once again, kind of thinking about exit 91, the ability to do housing on commercial with commercial development. So this schematic over here is kind of bird's eye view of what is an apartment building and then a townhouse development. And what I wanna point out here is that from street level on this side, these are like four step walk ups, but from the back side, they're drive in garages. So you have a half basement kind of on the uh, on the ground floor with the garage. You then walk up to the second floor from the garage and you have the first floor of the townhouse, the second floor of the townhouse, and that's one unit. But then there's a third floor loft with kind of, you know, studios or one bedrooms in there. From street view out here, you only have a three story building. Uh, and as a townhouse at three stories, it's not overwhelming and massing or anything, but you're actually getting to add a little bit of density in there. So that was the idea I was trying to kind of put forth there. There's two provisions in your regs. They're backed up here as number five and number six. You have this growth management provision that is highly restrictive. I, I believe it's illegal, and I believe your planning department actually has a legal opinion on it in the past, uh, saying that it probably shouldn't be utilized, and I don't think it has been utilized. I think it's just one of those simple things that next time you're doing some reg amendments, uh, probably not a bad idea to just repeal it. And then the minimum residential standard provision is also highly restrictive. I think it conflicts with market trends, inflates housing uh, costs and imposes uh, kind of an idealized middle class value on the space upon all housing. So, and what this is, and it's so many communities have done this, but you've basically said, oh, you know, any unit, whether it's multifamily or single family, can't be less than X square feet. And I can't remember what your specific number was. I believe you had like 600 square feet for a one bedroom and maybe 700 for a two bedroom and so forth. And actually your numbers aren't that bad. I've seen communities do a minimum of 1200 square feet or 1400 square feet. 
but I believe the building code's minimum dwelling unit is 400 square feet. And my feeling is, you know, why are we reduplicating kind of this minimum standard? That minimum standard is what qualifies as a habitable, you know, space and so forth. And especially if you're trying to get some affordable housing to serve a population uh, of lesser means that struggles to afford housing, and especially kind of in your higher density villages, you know, 400 square foot or even 450 square foot or 500 square foot uh, studios or one bedrooms can really be a good affordable option. And really, if you're kind of, if you think about trying to rehab a uh, old mill property or do some infill. So I just think it's one of those things that we're kind of imposing a value saying that, you know, in, at least in the context of affordable housing, Poorer people have to be able to live in the same amount of square footage as middle class people. That's my idealized middle class perspective. Uh, the fact is there's differences in what we can afford. And if you shrink the square footage, you actually shrink the cost of building it and you shrink the rents. So uh, residential mixed use. So you guys do have a mixed use provision in your regs. I give you credit for that, but it's highly restrictive. You only allow like up to 10 units of residential as part of a commercial development, which at the end of the day, you know, 95% of the times just isn't going to yield anything. Uh, the fact is, if you then look at an area like exit 91 or so forth, uh, you know, and you look at potential properties that could see some redevelopment or could see some ad addition of residential to them, you need to be you need to get something more than uh, 10 residential units to make it work. So in general, you know, kudos for having it, but it really needs to be revisited. And I give a lot of kind of specifics on um, how that provision can actually be improved. And uh, ultimately, I truly believe create some opportunity, especially in areas with kind of underutilized properties. And that's where this kind of special note on this one, I meant to add, I'm sorry, it's exit 90. I keep on calling it 91, uh, you know, and I, I forgot to add the other exit to this, which I think is 92. Uh, but I think those two areas are really kind of primed for mixed use, even up at 92, where you, you've already got some commercial development but some of it's probably over parked, large, vast parking areas that just, you know, they made sense years ago, then underutilized today, and the ability to put some housing in the parking lot of a retail center and so forth uh, definitely has some potential. Which brings me to then your parking standards, and don't feel like I'm criticizing you at all with this. Uh, there's almost never a community I don't end up saying to them, reduce your parking standards. When I was town planner in East Windsor, my commission used to yell at me all the time that Route 5 uh, through our town looked like a parking lot. And I used to yell back at them and say, that's because your zoning regs require it. And then we'd get an application and I'd be like, you guys reduce your zoning regs. They're like, no, 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 we need two, two, two spaces per unit or whatever it was on uh retail and so forth. And the fact is we, we created these parking standards, which you guys are no different than any other community, but we created them decades ago to serve a different point in time. And the fact is parking utilization has decreased dramatically. Uh, and I just, in my findings here, I give you one little stat, 47.7% of your rental housing units in Stonington are occupied by single persons. You guys require two, two parking spaces per unit. You know, 47% of your units only have one person. Uh, it, it's just, it's too high of a standard. So considering backing down to like 1.5 uh, spaces per unit would go a long way. As explained here, parking's expensive, especially structured parking, but even parking uh, just, uh, surface parking spaces add cost, they add drainage, they're not good for the environment, uh, and you can do with contracting them down. 
Number nine, uh, oh, I just had Beatles moment, number nine. Uh, but anyways, uh, lot size and non-conforming uses. Uh, I want to thank Keith for this one, bringing this to my attention. Not the easiest to catch, so that staff insight's really important. But uh, your smallest minimum lot size in your RH zone uh, is 10,000 square feet. And the majority of this zoning designation is in Pocketuck. There is this zoning designation in Mystic, though, also. But uh, analysis done by staff uh, previously, you know, reveals that 50% of all the one, two, and three family properties in Pocketuck are on lots smaller than 10,000 square feet. And that means they have non conforming status. And that means when someone wants to invest in that property, add the, you know, second bathroom or, you know, bump out the room to improve the size of the kitchen or whatever, uh, a lot of times they can't do that because of the non conformity. So I don't have any really specific saying you should do this or these things, but this is an area where I really think you guys need to uh, revisit that initial analysis and look at the potential of dropping down those minimum lot sizes in those areas to get those properties conforming. If you're not comfortable with that, I think there is another way to write a provision to maybe specifically to that zone to allow properties to expand in certain ways, uh, even with the non-conforming status. And then just in general, I think another thing worthy of looking at, and I know it can be controversial or it may be hard, but where you have sewers, which is really your villages, uh, the two villages, Pocketuck and Mystic, those are your best opportunities for higher density. And I think revisiting kind of the multifamily provisions uh, and so forth in those zones is worthwhile to consider. So I'm gonna wrap up quickly with these last two sections. I give you a more detailed uh, description in the, uh, in the written report, but here I'm just gonna have you hone in on, this is kind of a way of looking at understanding permitted or as of right uses and conditional uses, the special permit. I tell this to all communities, communities whenever I'm doing zone re zoning regulation related work. And that is, you know, through your plan process, you decide land uses, and then you should really make a determination on what uses you want, especially from an economic development standpoint. If you want a certain kind of use, allow it as of right via site plan. Don't put the extra burden of special permit on it. Um, so kind of define what it is you want, allow it by site plan. It still has to go to the commission for approval. It's still a high standard, but it's not subjective like the special permit. So the more you can focus on as of right than you do on the conditional uses, the better off you are. And then uh, at the end of the day, we want, you know, at Gilman York, we use this phrase, we want a simple, swift, and certain land use approval process. Uh, I always used to say when I was town planner in East Windsor, my job was to help an applicant get an approval. Uh, it's not my job to stop them from an approval. The commission gets the final decision but I should be helping them to refine their application to make sure the best application possible comes before the commission. Uh, in saying that, it's all about creating a, you know, swift, simple, and certain uh, approach to the land use process. Great article written by, published by the APA years ago in their publication called Zoning Practice on the Development Review Process. I give you a more detailed description of this in the actual written report, but it's about what applicants want, and they want predictability, fair treatment, accurate and accessible information, a timely process, remember time kills deals, uh, reasonable and fair cost, competent staff, which you definitely have, not every town has that, and elegant regulations. Uh, I'd say any kind of actions, the, the more you can just kind of think about these things when kind of working with regulations, the more likely uh, you are to create a more equitable and fair process uh, for applicants. So with that, I will say thank you.
And any questions or comments or anything, I'll turn it back to you, Dave. Yeah, uh, thanks, Tom. That was that was really good stuff. Um, and we, what I'll do is I'll go around uh, the room and allow everybody uh, to ask questions. Um, so I'll call I'll call on people and that. Um, so start formulating your question or comment, everyone. And in the meantime, just to note um, that um, later on our agenda, and, and Susan has uh, asked for this agenda item to have a, a, a capital improvement project, or that's what it's called here, um, CIP, uh, that would fund the comprehensive rewrite of stoning and zoning regulations. So that would go hand in glove with using your recommendation to, in turn, um, support our goal of, of providing, um, you know, more mixed income housing in the town of Stonington, and more equitable and fair and diverse housing choices. So, uh, you know, it all, it all looks like it's coming together. Um, so let me start uh, going around the room and uh, if everybody could unmute when called on, but then mute back up again, that'd be good. Um, so first on the, I'll just go down the list on the roster on the letterhead. You know, hopefully that's okay for everybody. So the first one is Kevin Bowdler. Um, Don, my first question is more just a basic education uh, question. If you go back to that slide with as of rights. Yep. Um, you you, you you went through it so fast, I couldn't quite get my mind around exactly <laughs> as of rights are versus the conditional use. If you can just please okay. maybe do an a explanation 101 on as of yeah. rights. Yeah. So in zoning, there's really two ways that anything can be permitted. It's either permitted as of right. That means if it complies with the regulations, it must be approved. There's no subject to subjectivity to it. And the as of right approval can either be staff level, a zoning permit. So probably in your town, if you want to put up a shed, get a swimming pool, it goes through staff. You know, does it comply with the setbacks, the height? Yes, it does. It's signed off. It's approved. Or as of right with the Planning and Zoning Commission is, you know, the new big Y shopping centers come to town and, you know, it's a site plan review. It's not a public hearing. There's no subjectivity. But the staff, the, uh, the commission, in addition to staff, get to actually scrutinize the application to make sure it complies with the regulations. The special permit or the conditional use is then basically zoning authority allows you to identify uses that may be acceptable in the zone. So, you know, you allow retail in the zone, but due to things like say traffic impacts or environmental impacts, you say that big box retail, you know, 100,000 square feet or more requires a special permit, that it rises to a level of sensitivity or concern that it needs this more detailed review. And what the law says is you write in standards and conditions into your regulations that can be applied uh, to the special permit. That then requires a public hearing approval by the commission. And in addition to basically the site plan, does it comply with the regulations? They can then consider those subjective criteria, like does this have a negative impact on traffic volumes or, you know, does the left hand turn across traffic, you know, create an accident hazard and so forth. So it's a more subjective approval. And that's why I'm saying you want to favor the as of right on the developer side, they know coming in. You can deny them for almost any reason on the conditional permit rather than the as of right permit. And that's where it kind of undermines predictability. So I tell all towns, you know, be conservative with that. Limit your use to those things that really need that attention. Okay. So it wasn't like there's a whole stack of things in our regs that you thought was too restrictive. You thought your recommendation is we basically should review everything and err towards granting as broader as of rights that um, was consistent with our POCD and our town values. 
Yeah, so, you know, if, if Dave just mentioned you guys might be getting some money due to a comprehensive update to your zoning regs, my recommendation would be go through all your uses. Look at all your uses and all your zones, especially on the commercial side, but also maybe related to multifamily and mixed use development. Uh, go through those uses and kind of ask yourself, why is this a special permit? You know, why does it rise to this standard? And what I find with most communities, you know, their typical answer is, oh, it's just always been that way, but we'd actually like to see that. So why is it a special permit? So just doing a review and going through and, you know, seeing which ones you feel comfortable allowing as of right, it can go a long way. I'm doing it right now with the town of Enfield. And uh, I'm convinced we're probably going to shift about 35% of what our special permits and commercial zones into the, you know, as of right column. And I think that'll go a long way helping them redevelop sites uh, that are struggling in the town. So, okay, that's great. Um, next question is, did you prioritize your, your zoning ideas in what you thought was most important or that you just came up with 10 and they're not necessarily a priority order? Yeah, I came up with nine and they're not a priority order. So okay. they're just the way I approach them. Yeah, because um, number nine, I, I think is potentially a, an opportunity. Um, but I, I'm not, I suppose what, what we don't know is for all of these things, there's, there must be a reason why we said 10,000 square feet is the minimum lot size. Um, and are there unintended consequences, which I can't think of of saying if we, you know, came up with some, did some analysis, said, listen, if we went to 8,000, we could, um, you know, we'd have a lot more conforming properties. But this also ties in a bit with your other point on the size, the minimum size of houses that you know, a lot of people say, listen, I'm really happy or I want to live in a really small place. Uh, but you don't want a 400 square foot house on a 10,000 square foot uh, piece of land. Um, but yeah, anyway, my question is, is this um, unintended consequences of reducing the 10,000 square foot minimum that we've currently got? My, my, I mean, without doing this specific analysis myself, from my experience, my gut tells me, no, there's probably really no unintended consequences, uh, especially if what you find, and I think that this is where the analysis is important. What is the actual typical lot size in those areas? And, you know, if it's 7,000 square feet, then getting down to that 7,000 square foot minimum will be great. And I use that intentionally because I didn't say 5,000 square feet. If it's 5,000 square feet, then maybe that individual lot could be split in the two lots. That's where you may start seeing, you know, some change or whatever. But without knowing what the actual typical lot size is, it's hard to say. My guess is it's not as small as 5,000 square feet. That's down to an eighth acre. Uh, 10,000 is a roughly a quarter acre. So my gut tells me there was no logic to the 10,000 square feet other than it was a quarter acre. Uh, <laughs> that's usually the way zoning works. We like quarters, halves, and holes, you know. So uh, I, I really can't think of any substantial downsides. Uh, so. And that's all my questions. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, next up is Jim Lathrop. Hi, Don. Great presentation. Some of your ideas, I think I almost shed a tear. They were so good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it, it's nice to hear some of those innovative approaches. But I have a few questions that I'll try to buzz through really quick because I know a lot of people. Um, sure. You mentioned PV, actually increasing PV5 density beyond what it actually is, which would Density can be as high as 43 units per acre if the mixed use provision is imposed. And also, um, they're down to one park parking space per residential unit. Are you advocating actually more than that? And are there examples of this in zoning in some of the towns you've worked with? Wow. Well, uh, I'm trying to remember and just please uh, forgive me here. There, if I remember in the PV5, there was a very unique circumstances where the density could get up that high. I think the more likely or more typical density provisions were still fairly low in that zone. Keith can correct me if I'm wrong. And I'm, I'm just not having a strong enough recollection that maybe I erred there. It was eight, um, eight units per acre is the standard if you don't hit the met residential mixed use and 
don't build yeah. your There's about four provisions you need to do to hit the bonus density. Yeah, and when I kind of, you know, mentally walk through those four, those provisions, the it, it's it's not very easy to get there. So I'm not saying that you should go over 43 units per acre. Uh, what I'm saying is it should be probably made easier to move up the density, you know, so getting to 15 or 18 or 20, uh, that should become easier. And I, I'm feeling like, and just forgive me, I'm feeling like I may have missed that parking provision in that zone. I think I was, if, if there was a specific provision there, but in general for your attached housing or whatever, your, your residential was two spaces per unit. And if you do have carve outs that allow that to go lower, I applaud you on that. But overall, I would still say review your parking standards to kind of contract them down. Okay, um, next question is the town has in its inventory um, some units that, that are affordable by rent, uh, but not a, a affordable by definition by the state of Connecticut definition can't be counted. Um, as such, um, how do you and things like ADUs and stuff like that, which will be coming up hopefully with a relaxed regulation on that? How do you incentivize getting an ADU to an affordable housing unit, for instance, uh, to get it counted? How because you talk about I don't think anybody would voluntarily do that. I don't. <laughs> so so how do you so? But you talk about it and say, well, maybe out of the goodness of their heart. But, but my my guess is it would have to be some other incentive. What what do you do there? So it, it, it's kind of funny. So uh, I believe I, because I helped North Stonington on their regulations and walked through, they already had that provision there. Uh, and I went through it with them and kind of tweaked it and modified it. But I, I remember myself saying to them, like, who in their right mind is going to do that on their own? Uh, <laughs> so we're not alone in that. Uh, or you're not alone in that thought. Uh, my, my thought is, you, you're right. If, if I'm a single family residential homeowner, you know, why am I going to restrict or undermine like what I can get in rent? But the fact is, the ADU, uh, I think in some ways serves multiple purpose. You could be doing it just to kind of get a rent, uh, utilize some underutilized space, and earn some income or go towards your mortgage. Uh, that's one motivation. But if you're initially motivated for the traditional in-law apartment, we're going to have mom and dad move in here or whatever, then you actually may have a motivation to consider the, you know, affordable provision. You know, maybe they're on Social Security, fixed income, and so forth. So that may be a rare circumstance. But then the other way to look at it is how do you incentivize it over the other? So you could create a more restrictive provision on the traditional ADU and a more flexible provision on the income restricted ADU. Uh, and, you know, floor area could be that where I talk about, you know, may, maybe, you know, you get rid of. So right here, you know, it says you can't have a. Or was it? It was the 2,000 square foot minimum, or whatever, before you could have an ADU. Oh, I'm in the wrong section. Uh, <laughs> help if I was in the right section. Uh, accessory apartments. So yeah, you know the 2,000 square foot minimum there, or restrict the. Uh, uh, you know, there there were other provisions in there. You could play with those provisions, and you know, you could say that you know if. That that 2,000 square feet doesn't apply if you do a qualified affordable, so then someone can come in. So you could look at a way to kind of play the regulations against them. That being said, I'm kind of being contradictory to some of the stuff I've already said in this presentation. I don't want you to end up with an overly restrictive normal ADU, you know, provision that becomes prohibitive because you're trying to incentivize the affordable and no one's doing the affordable, so you're not getting any ADUs. So trying to find that balance of how to make it work. The one other thing I'll throw out there is I believe you could also probably offer if your town has a tax abatement policy, you could probably amend it to include an incentive on a qualified ADU. So. 
Toby, you mentioned something like it's just, uh, some sort of property tax incentive for somebody to say, okay, I have this, um, yeah. I have this, this uh, old inventory, two family, but if I fix it up to a standard X, I can get, you know, some sort of small abatement from the town to make it worthwhile for me to deed it. Yeah, and you could, it could even be just something as simple as, you know, freeze the assessed value for five years that you, you don't pay any taxes on that new unit until year six or something, you know, so. Kind of a couple other things. Um, we have several commercial zones we brought up at other meetings, CS5, LS5, GC60 zones. I'm not sure how intimate you are with the zoning regulations, particularly for Stonington. But those are kind of the gateway commercial zones on route one and route two. That go from village to village. Would you, uh, based on the, the strategies uh, you mentioned tonight, be in favor of maybe opening those up to a mixed use sort of development or redevelopment? I'm favorable to it in any of the commercial zones so long as you guys are comfortable. I kind of just being sensitive to the community, I recognize that those two highway interchanges are predominantly commercial in character already don't have a lot of immediately adjacent residential have some conditions that could probably be improved so i kind of focused in on those areas as being very suitable uh, that being said i think there is something to be said to look at many or most of your commercial districts for the potential for mixed use Okay, um, last question. This is a real quick one. Um, we're, we're building or advocating or putting planning forth for a building that could have a 50 year life. And we know that the way we use automobiles is probably going to have a huge paradigm shift in less than 10. How aggressive can a town like Stonington get on parking? And what have you seen so far? In, not not a city standpoint. I know cities are eliminating right and left, but what about towns like Stonington? And that's it for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think you need to ratchet back parking standards. At the end of the day, you know, we've just we've overbuilt parking for decades, and it's not because we've been stupid and overbuilt parking. It's because demand on parking was far greater. You just look at something like a shopping mall. Uh, we all used to work nine to five and not have a lot of flexibility, so everyone went shopping in the evening and on weekends, and you could see peak parking. Today, with our more flexible lifestyles, we just, you know, you, you just never see these parking lots max out like they used to. Those peaks have softened greatly. So we're overbuilt because we don't have the same style of demand that we had in the past. Uh, that being said, parking is king on the development side. No developer is ever going to build a site with too little parking. So I do have issues with communities that have been very aggressive and put in like parking maximums. I had two redevelopment projects, two private clients looking to redevelop sites in the city of Hartford, and it was their parking maximums. They got rid of their minimums and put in maximums. It was their maximums that killed the deals uh, that, you know, they had a maximum of five parking spaces on a bank. You have a manager, you have a loan officer, you have a teller, you maybe have an administrative assistant, that's four, and you only get one customer parking space. It just doesn't work. So I think we've got to be rational, pull back on those standards, but I don't think we can get too aggressive yet until we truly see that paradigm shift of the automobile on the horizon. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Um, Great questions. Don, Don, I can summarize and put in an email, but I think Jim made two suggestions that um, we might want to consider to include on these slides or in your uh, in your plan and your write up uh, for the, you know, include some of the ideas for incentivizing ADUs to become affordable and also on the on the mixed use to to call out those CS5, G, GC60 and LS5 zones. Because if you look at the at the zoning map, they're all really um, amenable to to mixed use and including uh, residential, and because um, there's a lot of goods and services right where people would be living. So it's uh, I think that both of those ideas um, maybe bear calling out fairly specifically. Will do. 
I, um, I and, and I, I I applaud you guys on the input and I thank you and you know your community better than I do. So extremely helpful. Thanks. Uh, next up, Suzanne. Okay, here we go. Yep. All right. So um, I don't have uh, a, a great amount of technical questions, but um, we certainly want to streamline the process and the uh, parking uh, adjustment is really important, I think, for Stonington uh, when we compare with what uh, like Groton has done. Um, we really uh, have thrown out a lot of the regs. Um, the accessory apartment, is that um, like a separate uh, building on a residence? Is that what they were referring to there? I, I believe your reg, and Keith, you can nod at me if I'm wrong, uh, but I believe your reg allows both an accessory dwelling unit within an existing okay. house, or it also allows it in a separate structure, like you could do an apartment above the garage or something. So. Okay. All right. Well, that might you might want to um, um, detail that there. Okay. Yeah. And um, on the map, um, let's see. I wish I had this in front of me so I could scroll through. Um, on the map with the uh, where they're developing um, residential housing in the parking lot in yep. Colorado. Um, yep. What was the size of that community, for example? This is a much larger community. This is a ooh, 50,000, 60,000 uh, person community. This retail development here, you're just seeing the top quarter of it. It's a 750,000 square foot retail site. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were just looking at one little corner of it. Uh, the town itself was pushing us to look at larger portions of it for more residential. But in general, this has become a common thing with, you know, retail being overbuilt and contracting, parking mm -hmm. being overbuilt. These sites actually lend themselves really well to multifamily development. So. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then um, exit 92, which is route two. Um, yep. There is um, a big residential block there. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that. Yep. Yeah. I uh, I just when it's, I was saying not immediately residential, there there are some large vacant sites close to the exit that I don't think right. are pushing up on residential. And then you you have some a little bit further south there. You have some retail development that has some very large parking lots. That once again, I think could be looked at for mixed use. So I recognize there are residences up there. I just saw opportunities where you don't have to push right up to them. So. Right. Okay. All right. And uh, this is really interesting. I'm looking forward to getting my copy. Great. <laughs> nice we'll get it turned around quickly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Yep. Uh, Great comments. And uh, next up is Dan McFadden. Um, actually, Kevin and uh, Jim kind of covered most of the questions I got from this. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Thank you. And, and like Dan, I look forward to digging into it. Um, just off the top of your head, and I know you're tired, and I respect that. Uh, just in context, as I approach this report, um, are there like two areas that you find particularly important that we should uh, not lose sight of as we go through the, the pieces here? Uh, I'm trying to refresh my memory by scrolling through this. So from, I, I think biggest bang for the buck, simple things to do. Uh, reduce that parking standard, I think is key. Actually, three things. Reduce the parking standard, allow for greater density on the attached housing, multifamily, whatever you want to call it, and allow for greater density on the mixed use provision. You do those three things and you allow those mixed uses up into those commercial zones. 
uh, or those commercial areas, uh, I think you'll pretty quickly see some activity. So great. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's it, uh, Dave. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, Virginia. Hi, thanks again for presenting. I don't have any questions, but thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Uh, Pete Robinson. Um, yeah, I just, um, it's interesting stuff. I was just uh, following up on what Kevin said, uh, you know, the number nine. If you, and maybe it's not, um, doesn't make sense, but if you had in your personal view, and maybe you just kind of said it, but if you were to prioritize them or just make mention of that in the final report, that might be helpful because, uh, and that was all, all I had. So thanks. Thank you. Good idea, Pete. Um, and how about John Godin? John's left. The, John has left the building. Sorry, he had to leave at seven. He has. Uh, he's on another board. Um, but Tuesday nights are good for him, so he'll be joining us on Tuesdays. Uh, so, uh, Colin, Colin Hagen. Oh, you're muted, Colin. I double muted. Um, so one of the things that you that you brought up that really resonated um, was around reducing or providing flexibility to the 33% commercial use requirement. Um, yeah. So that's obviously, um, you know, relates very closely to the uh, Campbell Grain building. There's also another, you know, major lot um, uh, near Whistle Stop or former Whistle Stop, I think that would probably fall into that too. So, do you have any specific recommendations or thoughts in terms of, you know, what provide flexibility might mean? Yeah. Uh, th so let, let me explain my issue with this. Uh, and actually, I just I'm reviewing an application. I'm going to be reviewing an application for the town of Holland, and I just had a discussion with the developer. They have a 50-50 provision. The square footage uh, between residential and commercial needs to be 50-50. And the developer is looking to get that reduced. I was involved in an application a number of years ago in Canton, Connecticut, and they had a mixed use provision and basically said there had to be a minimum of 20,000 square feet of commercial retail or office space uh, with the multifamily proposed. And I was working for the developer, not for the municipality. And the developer knew he could not get that 20,000 square foot space leased. So he was fully willing to build the 20,000 square foot space and eat it to get his residential units. And for me, I just sat there with this kind of like, this is a lose lose for both sides. He, he, he's going to build this with recognizing he's not going to lease it. Well, that's just that, that's just silly. Town side, they're going to end up with 20,000 square feet of vacant commercial space. Uh, and that's my point. At the end of the day, these provisions, because I know on the town side, it's about we want to make sure we get the mixed use development. You know, we don't want them to build the residential and never build the commercial and so forth. That's where these provisions kind of come from. But at the end of the day, you know, we really can't dictate what that market's going to be for what the percentage should be. So I think the lower you can make that number, the better off you are if you need that number. The alternative is to, you know, uh, to provide a more flexible standard that's maybe a sliding scale that as you know as the residential units increase then maybe the percentage commercial increases you know get something moving together but it's just the fear that you're either you know because a lot of people may look at it and say oh i'd love to do the mixed use there but you know what i can only do 15 percent commercial so i'm not even going to go talk to them they may just pass it by 
Uh, so there, there are ways to look at it. You kind of caught me off guard and I'm tired. Uh, but th th there are ways to do it. It's just get away from that rigid, you know, it has to be this. So. That is all I got. Thanks, Bob. Hey, thanks, Colin. Um, so, uh, uh, great questions, everyone. Um, I think it was important to keep him on his toes. And, uh, and I guess, John, in interest of wrapping up then, um, do you want to spell out next steps or what the EDC can do to, um, to further assist you at this point? I do have a... Oh, this yeah, I do have a, a, you know, I want to talk about the, the land bank so that I know that's something we can help with. So not that, but anything else follow up in this session and next steps. Yeah, so one I think is, uh, you know, I think the land bank, if you guys could help with any of the research on that, that would be very much appreciative. I really, at this point, uh, I've been focused so much on these two reports. I've actually kind of forgotten what my third report is. Uh, which I know I have to start working on because uh, it's next in the pipeline. So I need to circle back with staff for some kind of immediate next steps. I need to get these revisions wrapped up for you guys on this. Uh, but I know I'll definitely be prepared with more information for next month for you guys. And before you cut me and let me go, Dave, I just want to applaud you, Dave. You run the most efficient meetings of anyone I've ever encountered. And I want to applaud the rest of your committee here because they asked some of the best informed, knowledgeable, thoughtful questions uh, that I've encountered in most communities. So I applaud you guys. Great job. Uh, thank you, Don, uh, for, for the compliments. Uh, we do have a great group on, uh, you know, they're, they're an engaged group and uh, I think we keep getting better. So that's, um, that's kind of the goal. So I'm, I'm really, you know, we have fun, but we also uh, are curious and are energized and want to make Stonington better. So we're all working towards the same goal. And um, and so thank you for that. Uh, so certainly reach out to us. Uh, I know. So one action then would be um, you're going to do some revisions to this report and then send it to us. Or maybe you're going to send us this report and. Uh, I think I'll try to I'll try to uh, summarize some of the comments I heard, and maybe ask members of the EDC to, um, you know, if I miss something, to to add it in, and then uh, we'll get um, we'll review that, and and then also, but if if there's uh, if you want anything else that we can do to help in the before the next meeting, please don't hesitate. Yeah, I'll send you guys the slides, uh, but there's a full narrative report that once it's tightened up and staff signs off, we can get to you. Very good. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. All right. The next, um, so we, 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 we spent a little bit on that, but I think it was very important and the uh, questions were excellent. So that's what that was, like I said, that was the main feature for tonight. And we wanted to um, definitely devote some time to that as all quality stuff. So, um, but part and parcel to that, no pun intended, is uh, you know, we, we said one of our goals is to work on or write a white paper for um, the notion of a land bank and how that might be applied and it could go into our affordable housing plan. And so Don provided some of the kind of key resources or key you know links to the key resources and um, and said, start with this. So, you know, he thinks that, you know, rather than try to get um, buried under a whole bunch of different um, sources, you know, part of part of which is part of our challenge, knowing what is the good information and what is the not so good information. So he provided us with that. And I, I guess my question then is, did that does that light anybody? Does that light anybody's fire with regards to maybe putting together a draft of a a research paper? Because I, I mean, I unless somebody really is, you know, don't volunteer for it unless you really want to do it. Because I I'll get I will get started on it. And so one way to get accomplish this would be I could write a rough draft and ask for everyone's input. Or if someone says, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend uh, 
you know, a couple hours working on this and put together a solid draft, we would want it completed by the December meeting in time for that December meeting so it could be considered there. Hey, hey Dave, there yeah. is an Eastern Connecticut land bank. I know Colin and I have discussed it a, a couple of times. So these people have already, you know, wove their way through the regulatory environment with which I believe there is a Connecticut state of Connecticut regulatory environment with the establishment of the land bank. I think we could leapfrog ahead most expediously if we could maybe pick their brains a little bit. Okay. Uh, Cause I think the rules are the same, whether it's Eastern Connecticut, Stonington, pocket deck land bank, Joe's land bank, you know, did, did anybody see that story? I think it was in the wall street journal about the land bank in Fairfield. Um, and the rule of unintended consequences. So, so what it basically allowed uh, the wealthy people to do uh, was to buy up all of this land, put it into the land bank so you couldn't put uh, affordable housing on it. So that sort of set me back a little bit. Think, oh my God, you've got to be careful that we don't do something and then not fully understand what the unintended consequences um, should be. So, so, and I don't want to lower the bar of expectations, Dave, but I'm wondering, should we, should we first look at what is it we're trying to, what, what problem we're we trying to solve as far as Stonington is concerned with a land bank? Um, and then back into what is the, then to do a white paper to say, what's the appropriate land bank type options or solutions for Stonington? Kevin, just a, just a thought on that. I, my, my impression of this was a more activist housing strategy type land bank as opposed to buying up open space so it can't be developed conservationist type land bank. And I just wonder if, is that the kind of thing they were talking about in the article? I, I'm no, not familiar I, with the yeah. article. So that's why, again, I'm, I'm pretty ignorant on the whole subject, so I wouldn't pay too much attention to what I've got to say. But in my mind, I thought a land bank was a way where, where we or the town could better force the development of the things which we wanted. But, but, but there's probably a balancing act that the more you try to do something, the more unlikely you are to get it approved. So in many cases, you probably have to come up with something which is a win-win for everybody. Um, and then we may start to encounter things that you didn't necessarily want to happen or weren't part of your, your goal, which is why I thought if we, you know, if we've, well, again, I don't know, but, but whether we should try to figure out what's the, and maybe I'd listen to, you know, to, to, to Susan or, or Keith are probably much more knowledgeable on, uh, is, is the land bank goals, does it, does it, does it vary by town? And then, and then should we look first about what, what's, what's the right opportunities that we're trying to, or what's the, what's the problem we're trying to solve or, or what, or, or what are the opportunities we're trying to improve in Stonington with the use of a land bank? So, so I, I would I would suggest that again I think it does vary and I think the article or two that I've read about it I don't consider myself that well informed did talk about that but but let me give you a couple of for instance you have a land bank with public capital in it the land bank can, can has various strategies let's say the land bank's goal is to um, improve affordable housing within the town so you have a you have a distressed property that is not getting a capital injection from the land, it's say you provide a $25,000 capital injection in exchange from the land bank in exchange for county for having that needed affordable housing with provisos that you do this, this, and this to the property. That might be an activist housing strategy. Larger, you could buy a distressed property, um, invest in it, and, and uh, you know, turn it over to affordable housing. You could, there'd be, there, there are lots of things you could do. You could also partner with a bank on this to leverage your ability to do so. That's my thought of the active, it's almost land bank is probably a bad word. Maybe housing bank would be a better term. Jim, yeah, Jim I, I think, I, I think, I, yep, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. Or, no, I, this is Colin. Yeah, I, Colin, I'm ahead, curious Kevin. about, um, you know, I, I, I probably did like a one week, like feverish read of, of a lot of this different documents on online about land bank. I do think maybe what would be helpful, and I'm happy to take point in, reaching out to this Eastern Connecticut land bank and maybe see if we can, you know, get him on an agenda and maybe he can come and present and do a little time educating all of us a bit. But I guess that's what I would propose. Um, I'd say that the main thing that I had read about was this, this link between 
tax delinquency and repossession. And I think some of the initial talk, talks were around, you know, that we didn't have the level, I guess, as a good thing, we didn't have the level of tax delinquency in our town that would necessarily allow us to pull some of those properties into a land bank. But I think I probably know a hair more than ignorance, which is actually probably a more dangerous place to be. So I would suggest that maybe we could, I could reach out and see if he, he might be willing to either share documents with us or overview, or maybe even come and just talk to us a little bit about it. Yeah, to, to Cullen's point, there is no place for those distressed properties to land. In Stonington, and that has led to basically this, a standstill when it comes to uh, uh, town based foreclosure actions. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think the Stillman Mill is a perfect example of where. And so, Jim, I, I don't know about how wealthy people are, are buying up land bank property, but that's not what I, the, the, when you described um, the activist you know, um, model. That's the one that I think we would want to try to, you know, to Kevin's point, that would be the goal or why are we doing that? What problem are we trying to solve? So it'd be fixed. The problem we're yeah. trying to solve, I think then that sounds like a worthwhile exercise. Um, to, to, yeah, so if we basically, we've got blighted properties and we want some mechanism where it's easier for the town or yeah. rather, for some institution to take control. And that sounds like a, you know, not, not, not a bad, I just did a quick search, 25 towns in Connecticut have got a land bank. So, you know, it's moving in that direction. All right, so in terms of boiling it down to an action, how about if I draft an outline that kind of does a problem statement and I'll review the links that Don sent over um, and something for everyone to react to. And if Colin, if you want to talk to the Eastern Connecticut Land Bank and get some, yeah. um, you know, pointers, that, that would be helpful too. Sure. So our next meeting is December 17th. Um, I'd like to have something to provide to Don so that he, you know, has an idea of what could possibly go into the the plan as a, you know, as a recommendation. So that would cut, that's kind of the, the goal. That sound okay? Yep. Does anybody know how many blighted properties uh, have been reported to the town or are active that the town's trying to manage at the moment? No, and I don't think we have a real number on that. And part of the issue, too, is that our blight ordinance is a very high bar. A lot of times people complain that a property is blighted, but according to the blight ordinance, it's not because it has to have all these spe specific factors, broken windows and things like that. So um, what the blight ordinance thinks is blight and what the average person thinks is blight. <laughs> Be two different things, and at least so Keith, my neighbor, my neighbor count. who hasn't done their leads yet, that that doesn't count. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> um. Okay, I want to. In interest of trying to end by eight o'clock, I'm going to move along, if that's uh, uh, okay. And um, I think we have two actions: one for Colin and one for me to get started, and then. You know, expect to see something by email, and I'll be looking for uh, comments and suggestions on a draft. Uh, the next item is on the agenda is the uh, to discuss the uh, the wind company's proposal or request, I guess you could say, for a fixed assessment. So I provided. I'm hoping that everybody had a chance to read. Um, it's really a kind of a uh, talking points uh, that, you know, we as an EDC um, town leaders could use uh, when people ask questions about why should wind companies get a fixed assessment. So with reference to that document, which about a page and a half long, I, I put some first principles for mixed uh, income uh, inclusive housing. 
um, try to set a context for folks as to why it's important to have diversity in housing options in a town. Uh, and then the, you know, a couple of our favorite bullet points for the value to Stonington, which we've uh, seen and discussed before, and then rationale for granting when company is a fixed assessment. And I have uh, six um, separate points there. So I, let me just say what I think the bottom line is, is that um, to, to get access, so um, financing for um, a development of this type where they are not getting market rate rents um, can be challenging. So they need to uh, find and, and to provide a quality development um, so they don't cut corners on quality and finishes in the building itself, but they need to find economies elsewhere. And so financing is typically how this is done for any affordable housing project that you might come across. So um, they're looking for, you know, um, tax credits from um, the CHFA, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority, uh, to the tune of $19 million. Um, now, the way that $19 million tax credit deal can be uh, secured is through a competitive uh, bid or competitive application process where, uh, as you guys will remember, uh, when companies said that uh, CHFA might get 30 applications a year and it's only done on an annual basis, there's only one uh, review a year. Uh, they might get 30 per year and they might only approve seven or eight of those applications. So the way to get um, an approval or get an award is to accumulate as many points as you possibly can. So the points, you can look on, you can look on CHFA if you wanna really look at how you gain all the points, but um, you get points for things like uh, the mix of affordability and uh, and you know if it's near uh, near a train station, for example, so you get points for all that type of thing. You also get points for uh, what skin in the game the town has. So uh, to make up uh, the, the, there was a financing gap, so the nineteen million dollars doesn't completely pay for a thirty two million dollar building. So they have um, they have a, a, a you know a finance a capital structure, if you will, or a capital stack. And they were looking for a million dollars to fill a gap. So um, the community development block grant through the Department of Housing was available. And for that, for a million dollar uh, grant uh, would help to fill that gap from, through that program. And the good news is it's administered by the town. Therefore, it counts as town skin in the game. And that can then go on the CHFA application. That million dollars can go on that um, CHFA application as town skin, which counts for points. But to get the million dollars, um, the town would need to dedicate some funds. Uh, now that you know, we're just talking about the land bank. The town doesn't have a land bank with six hundred thousand dollars sitting in it, and that's what would be required as a kind of a town match to get the million. So. They approached us with uh, ideas for how we might come up with the six hundred thousand uh, dollars, roughly. And you know, there's, there's different ways of doing it. There could be uh, there could be fees that could be waived. There could be you know, it could have been from a, a land bank. The town could literally invest it in it, but uh, we don't have any funding to do that. In and, and so the uh, it boiled down to really to come up with that type of money. Um, a fixed assessment over 10 years. So if you've read that um, piece that I wrote, um, the you know the bottom line is the $600,000 gets you a million. The 1.6 million then is town skin in the game that gets you access to $19 million worth of tax credits. And so uh, I guess next I'd like to go for around uh, around the room and see if there's any questions or comments. And then I'm going to call for a um, you know a vote of support for um, for this request so that we can um, just you know have these um, talking points available and be at the ready to uh, support this if questions come up in the in the community. It will have to go to so just so you know it will have to go to. Um, 
uh, a town meeting. The, the town meeting process is, is um, uh, uh, difficult right now because there's no, going to be no in-person for uh, the foreseeable future. So then we get into a virtual town meeting scenario. Uh, if there were to be opposition generated that can't be offset by, you know, quality talking points like these, then um, um, you know, it's, Somebody could organize a petition that would be uh, 200 signatures would get uh, on a petition would force a referendum. So that would get um, now we're getting into a really awkward position um, that could really compromise um, the success of this project. So what we would like to do is look for a path of least resistance. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, if you read social media, you'll see uh, and uh, the the Facebook pages or, or comments in the day. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation that has been almost everything I've seen has been misinformation that's been um, on those on those sources. So, you know, if it's a minority of folks that just want to um, voice voice their opinion um, and, and and objections, uh, that's fine. But if it did build into a crescendo, we need to be at the ready. Um, to to help people understand the way things work. So if I could go around the room at this point, I'll start with uh, Kevin. Okay, Dave. So first of all, I think I think your letter was your note was very well written. Um, in looking at, um, you forwarded us a link to the lady who gave the presentation the other day about affordable housing in Fairfield County. Um, and one of the underlying themes there is you've got to try to convince people why the investment in your town is worthwhile and not so much about, well, you know, affordable housing is good. So I don't know whether there's anything you think you'd add to this note now about um, about diversity, about, you know, who we are as a people, about the benefits of, of, of having it um, there. Um, and I guess my only question is, it's still not 100% clear to me that that they won't get approved without this uh, tax abatement, um, and and what's yeah, so so I don't know how you mean. So I, I think in your mind, and you sort of say it, you know, way down that you know if if not for this, it's not going to happen. Um, I absolutely, as a taxpayer in Stonington, would 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 say you know we should invest the six hundred thousand if it's the only way the project's going to occur. Um, However, if you know, we, we never know what the, what win is thinking. But if the state did approve them, and then the town didn't, would they still go ahead? Yeah. So if the, uh, the consequence. So may, so thank you, Kevin. Um, Good it's, point. It, it's funny you mentioned the um, the the first point that you made. Uh, so I don't. Did you listen to that? Um, uh, yeah, I read. I read. I read it sort of fairly quickly, but it was yeah. sort of. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that I because I did I did I was on the Zoom for that and uh, I did listen to it and um, that I really like the way that they phrased that so I think that would be good to include. Um, as far as it, would it not get approved, the the consequence for not providing the six hundred thousand uh, to the town for the project is if they don't they don't know how many points they need to be one of the <laughs> projects to get the award. So if that's, if that's the case, then you know you're going to want to try to get um, as many points as you possibly can, right? And because you don't know how many you need, so you try to get as many as you can. So it's possible if the town didn't do this, they, you know, they'd have to come up with a they need a, a, to fill a gap of a million dollars, so they'd have to come up with that somewhere, and it's not in their it's not in their pocketbook, so that would have to come from somewhere. But um, if if they don't get enough points, and it was like you know, they would say you know, it was like they were just short one point, and you know, having the town skin in the game would have been one point and put us over the top, so we would have gotten the award, and that would be a, a pretty severe consequence. If they didn't get it, what would happen? They they you know, they'd come back next year, or they might say we're going to go, you know, we'll find another town that is um, you know more willing to to uh, to put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. Okay. And I'm probably too conservative um, that I would hate to run the risk of not having this project going, getting approved going forward. Yeah. 
But uh, I think to your point, you know, I can be, I can try to be a little bit more explicit on what the consequence is of what, whether or not they would go forward or not. Because I, I think that is a common comment that you'll also see on the Facebook and the reader comments in the day. Uh, Jim. Okay. Um, some good comments there, Kevin. Thank you. Um, you know, this one's, this one's kind of in my, in my backyard and for the record, I, uh, I really like what this this project could do for downtown Pawkatuck. Um, this is a very, very important project, not for just Pawkatuck, but for downtown Westerly. It's going to potentially change the face of our downtown area for the next 50 years. It's very, very important. However, I have a few concerns that I'd like to voice them in front of the committee publicly. I am uncomfortable with the timing of this ask, as I was with Perkins Farm. It seems a bit last minute to me. The application, if I'm reading the dates right, has already been prepared and submitted or is about to be prior to when this would be approved by the town. So it's going to go to the state without this. Um, this project, because it is a light tech project, if it's, if it's approved, already, already has a very large level of public subsidy, albeit from the state and federal level. This applicant has committed nothing in the way of um, things like easements or public ways or funding for anything to the town in 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 regards for you know or in um return for for getting this public assistance um the potential scoring of this project if i understand how it works because it's a town of stonington and a need for affordable housing should score well without this public um public help from the town of Stonington. I don't know that precisely, but I, I mean, my sense is I was told by Matt Rabane and other people I talked to personally um, when this was first advanced. Um, are, are we sure, are we 100% sure we are gonna get this matching grant if the public funding is, is presented? And, I, and perhaps um, Sue Cullen can comment on that. Um, the, last, the last thing is, I think it's likely that there'll be 200 signatures on this, uh, just based on, uh, based on the rumblings I see in the community. And we should really think about our EDC position on this. And again, I wanna, I wanna kind of bookend this with, I think this project is, is everything to the town of Pawkatuck. I think that public sub subsidy for affordable housing is really important and you need it, otherwise there wouldn't be as much. However, the I, I've listed a few concerns I have and I'd like the committee to consider them you know, as we, as we kind of parse through all this information. Okay. Thanks, Jim. Um, good insights and perspectives to help us think through this. Uh, Suzanne, I put you on mute. I put everybody on mute. If you don't unmute yourself, there's noise that comes through. So then I put you on, on mute. So you have to unmute yourself. Okay. All right. Well, I've got mixed feelings about this. It's sort of coming at the end here. And then what are the consequences? What are they all? I don't, I'd like to know what are the, all the consequences if we don't do this? Hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, it's a great project for, uh, for the town. But uh, it's sort of like feel like we're we're being brought up a little short here at the end. Okay. All right. So that's I, I think that's uh, aligned with some of Jim's comments. Also, uh, Dan. Um. Yeah, I just, I, uh, Jim, thank you. You brought up some really great comments that, and you know, this is much more detail than, than I do at this point in time. Um, and I share Suzanne's issues. Like this seems a little late in the game to sort of be presented with this. And I realize these are complex deals. Um, what is actually the cash outlay of the town? Um, Dave, can you answer that? Or can anyone answer this to me? Like what? Well, it's, it's, it's a $600,000 uh, fixed um, assessment 
over 10 years. So, excuse me. So the the town investment is 600,000. So in other words, Win saves $600,000 in tax payments that would otherwise be due. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a graduate, graduate yeah. basis. So they, they pay full taxes at the end of uh, the 10 years. Okay. It's about, uh -huh. it's like a hundred and, you know, a hundred, I got to look it up, but it's like $120,000 a year, something like that. Uh, okay. But, the, but so the total is the town's just giving up taxes that they're not getting right now uh, to the amount of $600,000 over the course of the agreement. Correct. Right. It's, yeah. It's taxes. They're not, they'll get about 120,000 uh, when the abatement period is over. Um, right now they're getting, um, you know, it's a couple thousand dollars a year uh, for a vacant, you know, derelict property. Right. Yeah. Under, understood. Yeah. I get it. Okay. Just, want, just wanted to confirm that for my information. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just want to say also, I'm sorry, if people come up with 200 signatures and want to do a petition and want to argue this, I have no objection to that. And the sense that that is uh, unfortunate, I, I just, sorry, Dave, I don't agree with you on that. Um, it's, it's a public, public decision, public money. And if that's what people want to do, I know it can get in the way of deals that, and I, I really do support this project. Um, I agree with Jim. I think this is really revitalized getting that many more people in downtown Pawkatuck is exactly what needs to happen. Um, so don't get me wrong on that, but it's just a little sentiment. Like if, if people feel that strongly and are going to put a petition out and and have a public discussion, I think that's good. And um, I don't think we should lose lose sight of that, given that the EDC will have certain points of view and, and recommendations. But uh, I think as we've seen with other things, if you don't invite the public in to have those discussions or express them, uh, you end up with bigger problems. Yeah, to totally, Dan. Um, so I, I didn't mean to indicate that um, uh, I don't support public discussion or, or the process, um, I do support finding the path of least resistance. Um, that's why we <laughs> exist, I guess, but to make try to make things happen. But um, I, I guess what I would say is I don't want to see 200 signatures based on misinformation. So the purpose of this, yeah. you know, talking point, yeah. the purpose of the talking point is to help the public understand if, if it does get to the point where there's a build a swelling of um of of, of opponent of objections and opposition based on what they read on the facebook page that would be too bad i couldn't agree more okay yeah. so i think i'm understanding where where you're coming from what the point is here a little better than i did okay Thank you for the comments. Um, Virginia. I'm going to unmute you. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Sarah. I was having, I couldn't do it. I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Um, I just want you to know I am listening and learning still about this. Uh, I do agree with Jim's talking points. I think that they're, they're good concerns. Uh, but again, I'm still listening and learning. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Pete. Um, yeah, so I'm more like in the Virginia camp. I'm I'm still learning as I go here, but um, I guess I'd hate to lose out on something. I mean, we want it to be perfectly transparent. I'm not on social media, so I don't know what the comments are being thrown around, but we certainly should have an informed public, but also be transparent. Um, and I don't think anyone's saying we shouldn't be, but um, as far as the timing and things like that, I'm, I, I don't know enough to comment on that, but I, I, I liked your talking points. I think people should realize it's, it, they're, it's not like they're paying money. There's something they wouldn't have got anyway. So I think that's an important point to make. Um, and uh, that, think that can very easily be lost in a social media world or just like, oh, can you believe we have to pay, you know, 600,000 bucks or whatever it is, you know? So um, anyway, I thought it looked good. I, I, I'm behind the project, so. 
Thanks. Th yeah, thanks, Pete. Uh, you know, some of the comments are, are along the lines of, uh, you know, deep pocket, uh, deep pocket corporation, you know, taking Stonington for a ride, you know, backroom deals and stuff like that. So it's stuff that really um, kind of, um, you know, as, as much as we've tried to have community conversations for people to under learn about the project, um, you know, a lot of people choose to ignore the information that's been provided and, and then aren't going to um, change their mind. Uh, you know, we've just seen evidence of that at, at the national level with a presidential election. So some people get their mind made up and that's that's it. Um, as far as the timing question goes, uh, you know, they, this was done on a fast track. I mean, they really, you know, because they wanted to try to make this application period and uh, in the beginning of November. Uh, and they really got started on it in the spring. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, they really, this is a fast track for them. So you'd like to have all the eggs in a row and, um, or ducks in a row, whichever. And, uh, uh, but this is the way uh, the timing worked out. So um, if that created, an impression that I, I think that was, you know, unintentional. It's just the way it came together. Um, Colin, uh, comments. Yeah, I, I think I, I feel sort of, I, everybody's comments sort of resonated with me. I think that, and I, I like the idea of, um, I think that there are probably very fact-based logical reasons why 200 people would want to sign something and um, that if that if that is what happens i just want to make sure you know i think the um i think sometimes there's speculation of well if this doesn't happen well we could put x there right and, and that's not necessarily grounded in sort of economic realities it's been a, a site that hasn't had anything on it for a long time so um you know and, and sort of what's you know, what's X percent of nothing, right? I think that's sort of what you had said, Dan. So, you know, I don't, if someone in the community came up to me and asked me to sort of explain explain it, I don't think that I could. I think that I'd probably have questions directly for when that I would want them to answer to, to you know, me and us, for me to, to be in a position to, to have a solid point of view, frankly. You know, I, I share excitement about the project, but also, Questions about, you know, I think that the timing of it doesn't leave a great taste in my mouth. Thanks, Colin. Um, Susan, do you want to weigh in? So I think some of the details maybe I can help fill in um, just from my past experience with some of these opportunities. So for the million dollar portion that's done through the community development block grant competitive process. Um, that process, it's a competitive process. It typically actually happens in the spring. The fact that there's actually money this fall is a very special sort of thing. Um, they actually had an enforcement problem and had taken some money back in through their coffers at DOH. And so they had made an invitation to just a few communities um, for projects that they thought would be very highly rated um, in terms of how they rate and rank these opportunities. So the fact that there is an affordable housing component here, the fact that you have, um, you know, really easy access to transit within a walking distance of the building, that you're in a downtown area. So there are all these things that come together that would make this application rate really high. Now, one of those pieces is that $600,000 piece. So the fact that it's not just the million dollar infrastructure grant that the town would be, um, that we've, we've actually already applied for. Um, so that went in last week. And it's a very detailed application. Um, there's a lot of information involved with that. Um, it's a very heavy lift in terms of the amount of information that went through. Um, and I worked very closely with Wynn to gather enough information to be able to put that application in and be competitive. One of the competitive pieces of that is this other piece of the tax abatement. So because Stonington isn't sitting on a land bank or a revolving fund, um, in other communities I've worked with, 
they literally just pledged cash. <laughs> so the fact that we didn't have a bank account full with cash um, to bring up that percentage um, means that you don't get those rating and ranking points to be more competitive. So one application sort of leads into the other um, and one sort of adds to the other in terms of the layers of that capital stack to make this all flow together appropriately. So we've worked very hard on that competitive application for the million dollars in infrastructure. We did talk with the state um, because in terms of COVID, the town itself is dealing with some sort of strange circumstances right now. Uh, because for us to do a tax abatement, we actually have to go to, you know, it has to get referred from the Board of Selectmen. We have to go to a full town meeting, which not everyone has that procedure to have to do that, depending on the type of government you have. So we went back to the state and we said, during a time of COVID, how do we hold a full town meeting? Like, how do you do that and be responsible? So one of the things that we actually discussed with them directly at the state was the fact that we would only be able to really make the referral. We wouldn't be able to hold the meeting itself. Now they said that they thought that we would be, that we should be able to proceed um, forward with that. With the referral, we should be able to proceed forward and that by the time that we were able to hold the meeting, they would be rating the application because there is a little bit of lag time between the time that the applications get put in and that they, the different parts of the applications get actually passed out to different members of their staff and then they get rated and ranked and held against each other for the competitive round. So they said to go forward that they thought we would have a very strong application. So timing wise, it is, it's a little strange and it's not the norm um, because their normal grant rounds actually happen in the springtime, not in the fall. So Susan, this I, is I an unusual circumstance. Susan, I don't mean to interrupt. I just want to make sure you're talking about the grant, not the LIHTC funds, correct? The CDBG grant, and that grant comes through the town. The town becomes a responsible entity who receives the money. And as the receiver of the money, we had certain, um, you know, we had to hold the public hearing before the Board of Selectmen. We had an environmental review that had to be done on the property that we had to review. So there were certain things that had to go on for the town to be the receiver of that money. And then the other piece of that is for the LIHTC grant, they're actually having a greater expectation of both the tax assessment and then the competitive grant itself. And then there are actually gonna be some energy tax credits that they're gonna be you know, looking for as well. So there's a whole stack of things that have to piece together for them to make you know this financially work all these pieces it's like putting the puzzle together but but just to just to be clear they will probably know if they get litec funding before we know when we get this grant right i'm not sure i can say yes or no to that um because i'm not the person from the state who's reviewing you know i i don't know if the state's going to close in the next four weeks i don't know which state staff members are still in their offices. There's there's kind of a lot that's not typically going on. So I would hate to say something on the record and then be sorry for it because, you know, there are certain state offices right now that we're dealing with that literally are fully remote. Right, it just, it, it to me, it's hard to be, based on the timing of this, isn't it kind of difficult to make a but for argument on the, the that they need the million dollars to get the LIHTC funding. It just seems like they're concurrent, not uh, sequential. Would that be accurate? Jim, um, your internet went up and down during that. Can you say that again? Right. It just seems from, from hearing what you just, from what, what I, my understanding of this, especially with some of the details you just added is that the LIHTC funding and this CDB, uh, this community development grant combined with the town's input um, seem to be sequential things, uh, not sequential, I'm sorry, concurrent things rather than sequential, meaning the LIHTC funding is, not, is, is in reality not going to be dependent on getting this grant because the timing of the funding, I believe, for LIHTC is, was, was called out in the spring. Is that correct? I remember hearing that many, many times from Matt and his team that we'll know in the spring. Yet the CDBG sounds like... Um, 
um, about the same time. Is that accurate? Uh, maybe I'm not understanding it correctly, but it sounds like they're concurrent. I just if you could elaborate on that. We've been very open with um, the Department of Housing in terms of CDBG of, you know, what we're able to do, what processes we can follow and what timelines we can meet and which ones we can't meet. Because we're, of course, trying to make sure that we're being, you know, as you know, responsible to our citizens and giving them the opportunity that if we hold a full town meeting and that people are able to come and participate properly. Um, and of course, some of those actual even processes, as far as the governor is concerned, have changed within even the last 10 days. So we're, we're also working with that with as we're trying to make you know, appropriate decisions to be able to offer, you know, really good public input to our citizens. At the same time, that's changing as we go along. So hopefully when we get to the moment that we're having, you know, this full town meeting that we're able to really engage people, inform people of what's happening so that we can, you know, do this appropriately. But in some ways we have no idea what that's gonna look like. I mean, in 10 days from now, we could be looking at, you know, going back to, you know, it, there's just, there's no way to know. There's no way to know. Assuming, assuming um, the, that you are, that the town is successful in securing this, the community development block grant, would that basically uh, write a check to the town who would write a check to WinCo? Is that how that would work? Actually, how that works, Jim, is um, that would be a million dollar infrastructure grant. And it's a reimbursable grant, so it's not a check that's written to to us and that we write it to win. Actually, what happens is win does the work. They prove to the town that the work's been completed. There's a whole set of processes and forms that go through in terms of review inspections of the work that's been done. And then they pay for the work. They submit their receipts and their inspections back to the town. The town reviews all of that and then decides that they think that they're ready to be reimbursed. They draw that money down from the state and reimburse it back to win. So right. it's a reimbursable grant. So we're not out anything up front and there's no sort of check that we're writing to them. No, that, that's not really where I guess, I would more so rather than the mechanisms of that, I guess, uh, I guess that's you know, the way I phrased it would probably sound like that. Is is there going to be earmarked infrastructure? Because um, you said they have to document receipts. Does that mean they simply have mm -hmm. to show you I bought five hundred thousand dollars worth of wood for the building or cement, or is this specific infrastructure? And is that infrastructure things just like the roads to the building? Is it sewer? Like what is what is the earmarked infrastructure for a community development block grant? Okay, so there are actually different types of community development block grants. There are different categories of them. Um, in this case, they're asking for a million dollars in infrastructure that will help um, the the um, the actual utilities to the site. And so they provide a scope of services, a scope of work of exactly what's going to be done. And then those inspections back and those reimbursements back are based upon that specific scope of work that's being done. And how it actually works going back is sort of interesting because it's sort of like a double double thing. They do the work, they get the work inspected, we go back, we, you know, we approve what they've done, we inspect what they've done, we sort of receive their piece of it, and then we go back to the state, we draw the money back down from the state from the grant, and then we have to, you know, talk about the fact that, you know, we're reimbursing them back the money. So we're sort of the receiver of the money and we're the keeper of the money um, in terms of bringing it back to them. But none of that money is advanced. Uh, you only get done, you know, they get money for work that's been finished and completed and inspected. And there's a whole checklist of things that goes on to make sure that it's done properly um, and that things are, you know, to code, to fire code, to building code, you know, depending on the type of thing that it is. So there's a very lengthy procedure of how that goes on, but none of that money is advanced. Um, it's only for work that's been completed. I understand. So a fair characterization of this would be instead of private funding 
of the bringing the infrastructure like utilities and so on to the site to support the building, this would be transferred to, let's say, a public public funding, be it by the block grant or the tax abatement. Fair? Yeah, I think that's a, a pretty right. fair way to say it, at least as far as the CDBG grant is concerned, that that's mm -hmm. basically that million dollars in infrastructure. That's what's going on there. I mean, there are some other things in the capital stack that have to do with energy, tax credits for energy and other things. But as far as the CDBG is concerned, it's for dedicated infrastructure. Now, if you were in another town or another, um, you know, another you know, project, you might have gotten um, from your EDC, you might have gotten, oh, okay, a dedicated amount of economic assistance, you know, towards your infrastructure, towards pipe utilities, towards sewer or water, or whatever you needed um, to sweeten the deal for you to build in a certain spot that was appropriate. So this is sort of in lieu of that, and there's no outlay for the town in terms of that million dollars. I, I would I would suggest that this potentially is a is a uh, a better communication point to emphasize. Um, if EDC does decide to go out and and really go behind this hard, this to to characterize it that that's to to me from a logical standpoint a better way of characterize you know what I mean to to try to explain this to the public. Well, what is this? What is this tax abatement for? What is this subsidy? Why are we going out and spending time doing a grant on this? Well. Has to actually get the utilities to the place where they're building the thing, uh, which is pretty, you know, expensive in a downtown area, and uh, you know you have to increase capacities and so on. I think that, I don't know, but that to me sounds like a, a salient talking point. Just, just putting that out, putting that out there. Now, I assume that if the project doesn't go ahead, then Wynn doesn't get the the the, the million dollars. Right. So I suppose what we're, what we're talking about here is does EDC support writing a letter, writing a letter of support to say that we should, um, uh, you know, we, we are behind the, the tax abatement. Uh, mm -hmm. We, the EDC, are uh, pro-development. We are pro-growing the grant list. Um, and one of the things which I heard from one of the uh, Republican senators last week was that whatever it is you're discussing it is true until it is no longer true so irrespective of the timeline or what might happen i think we have to work on the basis that it is true that the project doesn't go ahead unless we support the six hundred thousand. now if we have a town meeting and it doesn't pass then then that's another thing if we have a referendum that's another thing but but i think it's beholden to us to push this to the next stage which is to write a letter to say and it's a great opportunity for us to say, here's our arguments as to why we think this $600,000 tax abatement is a good investment um, to the town. Um, and I'm personally very happy to have, you know, put my name as one of the people on the EDC to say I voted uh, for it, um, even though I might have some mixed emotions. But I think we, we, you know, I think we have to go out and say, this is what's you know, it's not going to happen unless we do it, and every person should make a decision based on that. Now, if the facts change in two or three weeks' time, then that's two or three weeks' time. But where we are right now on the 19th of November, and, and we have to agree this now, and we're not too sure how these things are going to come together, uh, then my view is we have to, you know, I, I would definitely vote uh, to write a letter of support for the $600,000 tax abatement. I, I have a question uh, for Susan. Maybe she knows this. Um, what other projects have we um, made a tax abatement towards? I think we did for Masonicare, and uh, I think there were other projects that there have been abatements. Uh, are you um, do you are you aware of those or? I know that they did one for the Perkins Farm um, that I've read about. And I think there's only been one other in recent history. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering what the name of it was, because I, I remember thinking that I was surprised that there had only been two of them in recent history. Mm -hmm. the, the other one was for Davis Standard. Okay. So to get Davis Standard, they moved uh, some operations down here from Maine and to get that, um, to sweeten that incentivize that um, they were provided with a, a fixed assessment. Those are the two recent ones. 
Are, is this request comparable with uh, those? You mean money-wise? Yes. That would I be. Don't, I don't know, but uh, I, yeah, I did, I, and it's pretty similar. The only the biggest difference was that um, uh, Perkins Farm was over a seven year period, and so they they paid a smaller amount, and then they had a big falling off, and then went straight to a hundred percent. This this time frame is a little bit um, is a little bit longer, um, but the dollar amounts not that. I'm going to say the other one was like seven hundred thousand, so it's not too far. Not, not too okay, far. The, so it's comparable. Same, yeah. The, the statute changed now you can do 10 years instead of seven too that's, oh, okay. that's important part. okay so so this isn't out of the ordinary it's just catching us off guard a little bit because of the timing schedule the fact that it's attached to a project that already has a significant level of public subsidy that is different. Whereas a place like Van Roland or Davis Standard would be private entities, which would not have any public subsidy to remove. Mm -hmm. hmm. So I'd say, would David Latizori have gone ahead with Perkins Farm? Anyway? And that's, that's the bet you're always making is, is, is it financially viable and, and will the developer go ahead? And one of the, the statistics which Jason told me, which scared me, was that 50% of projects which get approved for whatever reason don't happen. So whether it's they couldn't get the financing or the, the, uh, you know, the, the economic environment changed. So you think, shit, you know, that, that this, and one of the things which, which uh, Don just said is like speed is of the essence. The faster and the more momentum you've got, the more likely something's going to happen. If this gets denied now, it waits another year. And even if it got approved in another year, the, you know, the economy, the environment, the financing may be different, um, and, and then it doesn't go, doesn't go happen. So I think what we're talking about here is what what's the cost of giving it the best possible chance of success, even though we don't know for sure whether we're maybe investing $600,000, which we could have got the same result without having to have done the investment. But I, I'd rather get the millions of dollars over the next 20 years and, and suffer the $600,000 investment uh, than, than run the risk that we get in zero. I, I agree with you. I think the community, the benefit to the community is greater. And I think we just have to weigh that as a, a group. That's very well put, Kevin. Thank you. Okay. Um... Maybe we can wrap the discussion there. Um, Kevin, I think you almost made a motion to um, for the EDC to support. So do you want to formalize that? I'll make it simple. We'll say that I, I would raise a motion that the EDC writes a letter of support um, uh, to, and who is it to the, um, um, the first select people um, supporting uh, the tax abatement for the wind company uh, development proposal. Hang on one second. I'll second it. And any other discussion? Hearing nobody pipe up. Um, all in favor, uh, and I will call everybody's name so we can. Um, Keep track in case folks um, oppose. So I'll call myself first. I'm for uh, Kevin. I'm I. Kevin's an I. Jim. As I did with Perkins Farm, I will abstain. Abstain. Okay. Uh. Suzanne. Yes. Dan. Aye. Virginia. Sorry. Virginia, I didn't catch that. I think I'm going to uh, abstain as well. Abstain? Yes, please. Um, Pete. Aye. 
And Colin. Is there something is there something between a yes and an abstain? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, your label no. is Lucy Washi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I will abstain. I don't think I, I have as much information as I would like. Okay, so um, we have five, four, so that um, meets the quorum. And so that would say that we would provide our support. I think the timing. Susan Cullen, do you have, um, I know the Board of Selectmen were interested in having this happen in December. Is that still the timing? I think we're still working um, with how can we affect this, you know, as quickly as possible, um, but also to not sort of hit the week of Christmas that we're trying to make people, you know, be awake for a public meeting that that's probably not appropriate. So I think we're still sort of shooting for like the third week in December or maybe the first week in January, second week in January. We're trying to sort of make sure that we're getting all the right, you know, there, there's a certain amount of process that has to go on for us to be appropriate, to be legal, to be correct. Um, so I know we were originally, we're talking about December um, this morning, they were saying it might not happen till January. So I'm not sure what happened in between um, if, if they've consulted with the attorney and we had to change something in terms of a date. So I'd get back to you on that, but we're still somewhere in that, you know, sort of just around the holiday before or after. Okay. Um, let me try to uh, add a couple more bullet points. Jim, would you mind? Uh, writing up your idea for the how the investment is being used for infrastructure so the town is getting something out of it that could be added to this? Yeah, I'm happy to provide comments on that. Sure. Okay, so that'd be helpful. So I think you have to you have to have a story, Dave. I mean, you, you, you have to have a story that says, you know, this is people need a clear, concise reason. I also I also am going to make a strong recommendation that if there is a town meeting on this, whatever shape or format, get Matt Rabane in there. Have him take the questions. It shouldn't be all you, Dave. Have somebody from Win stand up to the people who are gonna. There's gonna be somebody or a few people, and take these questions. And if they can answer them, maybe that will help. I yeah. wish Matt was here tonight. Actually, to be honest. Okay. Um. All right. Then. And then, Dave. Yep. The the uh information that i haven't seen this facebook stuff at all but uh what information do people need to um be better educated and is there an action we can take to do that well that's a great question so um i think we'll you know kevin's motion put this in the form of a letter of support so I think we would what we would do is write to the Board of Selectmen and say we recommend that these are, are talking points that can be used. But I, I don't I'm not recommending that we like start making billboards and stuff. So you know this no. is really really complicated stuff and most people will struggle with understanding um, why that why you know the, they'll have trouble getting past the point that it's a that's a, a you know a handout to a a deep pocket corporation. They won't be able to get past that. So even with the best talking points or Matt Robana or anybody. So, you know, I, I I think it would be good to be prepared to be transparent, but we don't have to like, you know, I, I don't know that we want to over, you know, overdo things. So that 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 can all be um you know we can I think that's really well, the request is being made to the town. So it, it's really up to the town to provide direction on the path forward. Um, mm -hmm. as for, it's not up to us to do that. So really what we're doing is saying, based on our experience and our understanding of economics and financing deals, you know, we're providing these talking points, which can be used in whatever way you see fit. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, well, perhaps the town could use the media to uh, educate the community. There might be, a, might be a way to do that. And I, I think between Susan Cullen and, uh, and, and Danielle and the other two select women, um, you know, they would come up with the best path forward as far as that goes. Yeah, I think that would be good. Okay. All right, so we're way over time, um, and so I think we're going to go to 8.30 today if we can finish up. I know we have, uh, Kevin had a brief uh, branding and placemaking with regards to um, uh, uh, EDC stories that would be in the events magazine. So, Kevin, you want to go over that? Yeah, so, uh, um, you know, so what we, sh we should obviously try to hit, uh, have a story in every one of the quarterly uh, events magazines. Um, but we should also try to see if we could do a monthly story, which we could post on our website and, and stones and, and on um, social media. So uh, I was wondering whether has anybody got an idea? There was a list of topics which were out there. Um, does anyone have a suggestion of what would be an important story for us to write something um, about? And I was wondering whether maybe we should try to do something about housing. And well, you know, we don't. We can say we're doing a housing study, but there's quite a bit of information we've already got from the metrics in Stonington, which maybe we could put into a story. Um, another option is maybe we could do a story about, you know, what's a tax assessment? What's a uh, you know topic we we're just talking on as well. Um, but anyway, open to any ideas, and and obviously um, any any ideas, and if you want to write one. Um, When's the next issue? So, so forget about the next issue. Let's say we want to have a story done by the end of December, and we could, and even if it doesn't get posted in the events, our goal is to sort of do a story a month, which means that mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's nine of us, so you'd basically each person would be expected to write one uh, every ten months. I'm happy to write one at some point. That's fine. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I'll do one. I think the is there a topic you'd like to write about? Um, this is a good issue. <laughs> a housing issue. But um, uh, December is not a good month for me. I'm, as a retailer, that's that's not going to happen. But January, February, March, you know. I, I'll be conjuring up a con I um I can write something. Uh, Susan, you are nodding your head. Is there something that you think would be a, um, a suitable or more, more relevant topic for for now? I do have um, a couple of ideas. Um, because we received the bronze certification for Sustainable Connecticut, um, there were some interesting things embedded within that. Um, and some of them we were going to use as, you know, smaller sort of sound bites for 1649. Um, but also we could probably develop a couple of them into bigger articles of things that the town is either doing really well, focusing on, trying to take the next step in or trying to engage people to see, you know, are they interested in moving some of these areas forward? You know, would you, you know, even if it was to engage people in terms of, you know, for A, B or C, if we could do or spend time or money on these three things, which of these three things would you be interested in? So there might be a way to sort of inform people of some of the great things that we're doing, sort of celebrate that, but then also maybe ask them, you know, we could take the following directions in the future. What would you be interested in to see if we could, you know, reach out to people or get people to engage with us a little bit more? And, and who's the like the most knowledgeable person in town hall who's been, been behind the whole uh, certification uh, process for sustainability? That would be me, Kevin. You can uh, come and talk to me. Yeah. I, so if I come and talk to you, <laughs> do, you do you have enough time for that and I'll write the story? Uh, okay. We can work that out. Okay. I feel bad. That that's another thing you don't really need to be here. Need to be there. No, but it's it's also good PR for some of the good things that we're doing. Um, it was actually a good experience for me uh, because Sustainable Connecticut actually allows for a 
wide array of things that you're engaging across. And it's not just about pesticides or about water quality. It's a very holistic view of sustainability. Um, it goes even as far as saying like how trained your staff is in terms of information. So I, I think there could be a good opportunity. It was great for me to sort of come into the town and have to go and engage with a lot of the different department heads and commissions in town to get myself, you know, sort of better informed about the things that are going on. So there might be a good opportunity there um, in terms of, you know, not only saying that, you know, we won the certification and that we were able to across all these categories, you know, we're doing these good things, um, but then also give them a path for the future of what we would like to do in the future and, and where we're headed. Okay, now, because we're EDC, then maybe I want to look at it from, a, uh, uh, you know, what's the benefit from an economic development perspective um, to the sustain sustainability. Okay. okay, so for this one, I'll set up time, Susan, to come and talk to you and I'll take ownership for it. But then what I might do is, so, so Suzanne, can you give me a topic that you'd like? I'm going to like to get everybody's name and then what topic you want to write the report on. Then we'll sort of figure out over the next, uh, maybe we'll, you know, over the next nine months, which month you're going to do and what your story is going to be about. Well, I like the uh, affordable housing concept. Okay. Jim, is there a topic you'd like? I think I was kind of assigned to the green mill. I, I'd love to talk about that. I know, I know a lot sorry? about that. The green mill. Okay. I mean, I mean, I think it was already, I was already. Yeah. But are we, are we past that now? Do you think or we, should, we could talk about mills in Pakatak or. Uh... Yeah. I mean, we could include it as a larger thing for downtown Pakatak. Okay. Sure. It'd be more interesting. I think. Pete, is there a topic you'd like? Yeah, I wouldn't mind just doing a little blurb on manufacturing in town, you know. That, that would be great. We haven't, we hardly even talk about it. Okay, Cullen. I might need to think about it. Yeah. Wonder, could there be anything on, um, uh, Maybe, maybe it's because it's it's eight thirty on a Thursday night. I'm kind of inclined to talk about the uh, the uh, vineyard and brewery scene across our, our town. <laughs> so that, that, that's maybe top of cons consumption of alcohol might be top of mind right now for me. So, um, is there anything about not exit ninety two? Hmm. Come on, Colin, you love that stuff. No, I feel like I want to, there's, the problem is there's no good exit 92 story right now and I want to have one. That's the story. It may be housing or maybe, yeah, it's a, yeah. okay. Yeah, maybe that's let's, the story. Let, let you ponder on it. Dan, do you want to do something on tourism? Because we haven't really talked about that. Uh... Yeah, is tourism or marine services or, or actually, to be honest, sort of the, uh, the, Marina industry, we're part of it as as part of tourism. Um, I could I, and that could be a good maybe March, um, timing wise. Okay. So let me I'll, I'll I'll combine the two in some way about how they they work together. That'd be great. Okay. Um, uh, Virginia, can you tell me what what idea you want me to write about? I will write about it. Okay, that that makes it easy. <laughs> Virgi yeah, she's, she's your favorite I, reporter, I, I, should have, I should have done that, Virginia. That was smart. <laughs> oh, no, Colin, you can be anything as well. Well, you're still open. Okay. How, about, how about people masquerading as other people on Stonington Community Forum? <laughs> 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 Aliases on Stonington Community Forum. Okay, did I miss anyone? I should have missed. Oh, Dave, you get a pass. You do too much already. But I'll uh, so if I'm working on land bank, I would say I would say land bank would be Absolutely. one that I could write about. And then the other one is uh, we haven't talked about an EDC so much as um, I, I work with a, this guy um, 
uh, up at North Stoughton Conservation Commission to help get with Pocketuck Association to clear out debris around the Stillman Bridge to help because he his dream is to get a kayak trail from Boone Bridge uh, Road Bridge down to uh, Donahue Park and so we're going to meet on that in December so and if you guys remember um, uh, uh, Fagan wrote a, um, an article on kayaking the length of the Pocketuck River and, and we were mentioned in that so I wouldn't mind um, with a river theme and kayaking theme and tying in um, bringing life to downtown Pocketuck. Step in for like the next seven months. Thank you. Kevin, can you um, publish an editorial schedule then? Yep, I've got the list, so I'll um, I'll write them up and I'll assign a month, and we can always change that at the next meeting if there's a month that doesn't work for someone. All right. Um, we have one more item, and I want to get to it because it is time dependent. So Susan is if Susan's still, yep, she said she's unmuting, and uh, it's all yours. Okay, so I'll make this very quick. Um, when we go through the capital improvement program and we're, you know, begging for our money for this year, um, one of the biggest things that we can do um, as far as economic development in the town is to give people one of the things that Don Pullen was talking about, a clear path. So having clear regulations where people know what to expect what they can do here, what they can't, making things, you know, an easy and simple way for the things that we really want in the blueprint and making it more complicated for the things that maybe we feel like we need another layer of, of information for. Um, our regulations are very antiquated. Um, and the problem is that they have not redone in a long time. Um, so I've been here um, since May, so it's been like six months now. And one of the things that I asked Keith very early on was, you know, if you could pick like the, the 10 most important things that you could fix in the zoning regulations right now to make our outcomes more predictable, to make things simpler, to make there have to be sort of less of a, tour, like, I feel like he's acting as the tour guide for developers coming in because the regulations are so complicated and have so many funny nuances that people don't know what they're looking at. They don't know what they're gonna get. And so that makes it that we're not a great bet. So we wanna be able to give people those predictable outcomes. And I'm not saying that we have to compromise what we want for our town. I'm just saying that we need to have a clearer set of standards of how we go about it. So I asked Keith this question, you know, what would be like your top 10 things? He came back with 40 things off of the top of his head that were just on the small list of things that we could fix to make the P&Z process go smoother. And those were just the small things. So one of the things that we really need from the Board of Finance this year is we need to start to put together, it's going to be a big chunk of money. We're going to need to hire a private consultant. We're going to need, this is going to be a heavy lift in our department that's very overwhelmed as it is. So, but this is very important in terms of our future. So for the Economic Development Commission to be able to support us at the Board of Finance in terms of starting to put together a larger chunk of money to be able to make this effort is gonna be very important for us um, to make that clear path for people in the future. There's my pitch and as fast as I can do it because I know you guys have been here a while. Can it be Don Poland? What? Can it be Don Poland? Susan's frozen in time. So um I think uh Oh. Hi, Susan. 
Oh. Okay. All right. Well, I'll make a motion. <laughs> That's all right. Don't don't worry about it. I think we're just about ready to end, and you got your um your spiel out there. So we're gonna um I'm gonna suggest we so you want a letter of support for um for a SIP that would um go to the board of selectmen and the board of finance. And and do you have an approximate amount of how much money that would be? Okay. All right. So um that that's helpful. We can we can figure out the exact number later. All right. Okay. All right, let me get back to the meeting. Yeah, no problem. And um all right, we'll talk to you soon. All right, Susan's uh, laptop shut down. So I guess um she said, you know, this letter of support that they're requesting would go to the Board of Selectmen and Board of uh, Finance um, to help secure the funding. So, uh, and it would be, she said $75,000 and, you know, talked about getting half of it this year, half of it next year, but we can figure out what, that's about the ballpark. We can find out what the exact amount is. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure of the timing, but I would think it would be within, it would be, in the next couple of weeks. So I'd like to make a motion that the EDC provide a letter of support um, to the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance um, backing uh, funding of the comprehensive rewrite of the Stonington zoning regulations. And is there a second on that? I'll second that, Dave. Is there uh, any other discussion? If we bag one large project, because we made the regulations better, it pays for itself. Yep, totally I agree. agree. Uh, we know that this was in Jason's list and he lobbied for this for a couple of years and he, he felt it was very important. So, um, is there, um, I'll just go quickly around the room with a yay or nay. Um, so I'm a, I'm a yes. Uh, Kevin? I'm an emphatic yes, um, and I need to leave. <laughs> so, uh, okay. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Jim? Also an emphatic yes. Uh, Suzanne? Absolutely. Is that an emphatic absolutely? Yes. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, Dan? I'm a triple emphatic absolutely. <laughs> uh, Virginia, are you still there? Yeah, I, I am. Yes. Okay. Um, Pete. I'm an Irish Catholic enthused. Yes. So <laughs> it's, it's <been> <laughs> All right. You can tell we're at the end of the meeting. All right, Colin. Yeah, I had time to, to look up the thesaurus. So I would, I'm a vehement. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. So all in favor and, uh, we will, uh, do we have a volunteer to write, drop that letter? I, I, I would suggest working with Susan and maybe even asking her for a paragraph. Is it due? Is that? When is it due? Uh, like, I think, if, you know, I think within the next two weeks or so, we'd probably want to get it done uh, in the next two or three. I'm not sure exactly what the schedule is because Susan had to, you know, got cut off there, but we can find that out. Yeah, I'll take a step at it. That's fine. All right. So, Pete, I'm going to suggest that you uh, contact Susan on that and then yep. and ask her to write a paragraph or even draft the whole thing. And uh, we can put our flavor on it. And Sounds I'll, good. I'll work with you on that. Happen up, Pete. All right, um, I'm gonna make a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Any third? third. All right, um, thank you very much. That was a, that was a good meeting. I'm, I'm uh, gratified we had a robust discussion on the, uh, on the issue of the tax abatement. So thanks for that. That was very good. And we'll talk to everybody soon. Okay, okay. thank you, Dave. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thanks, Dave. See you, everybody.